Lord, we thank You that we can come and we can laugh and smile even when there are some things that would cause us to have some tears. So we thank You for placing us in a church family that can journey with each other. Whether we are celebrating births of grandchildren or first childs or um, having to pray for people who are seriously ill, we thank You that You are a God of all of those things, the smiles and the tears. So we lift those up to You. We pray that wherever we may need You this morning, that You can help bless us, touch us, and let us know that You are God. So we ask that You can also be with us in the remainder of this service. Open up our hearts and our minds to listen to Your voice. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So there was a uh, wife who was very upset with her husband because the husband forgot her at the anniversary. And the wife was so mad, she finally decided, well, I'm just going to tell him what I want. And she yelled at her husband and said, all right, listen, you forgot this. All I know is that when I wake up tomorrow, there better be something in my driveway that goes from zero to 200, 200 in six seconds. So the husband's like, whatever. And uh, he decided he was going to go out and try to fulfill his wife's um, wish because he did forget the anniversary. So the wife wakes up the next morning and goes out and expects to see something in the driveway, but instead she sees a little box right in the middle of the driveway. And he goes, she goes and opens up the box and the card said, well, you wanted something that goes from zero to 206 seconds. Here you go. And she opened it up and it was a bathroom scale. <laughs> the husband is still missing. So... You're welcome. The sermon is over. <laughs> D men, don't ever do that. <laughs> Prayer time would be different. So, <laughs> We're going to continue talking about the apostles and today we're going to talk about the um, disciple John who last week we talked about James and this is uh, James' brother. They were part of that group called the Sons of Thunder that we talked about. And interesting is James was the first disciple to die and John was the last. Okay, so you got went from the first and then to the last. And also, John was the one that if you have read things about the disciples, um, even in the Bible, it says that John was the beloved disciple. So whether you want to say that was Jesus' favorite or he had the closest relationship to, somehow Jesus and John were very close. And this is a story, this, this life here about John is one that all of us here should get behind. It's one that shows a story of somebody that was transformed very differently from what he used to be. And of course, we know that John was the apostle of love. And also an interesting note is that in Celtic theology, um, they follow the Gospel of John and the life of John, and then Roman theology follows the life of Paul. So there's a little bit of a difference. And, and in Celtic theology, they follow the Apostle John because they believe that John embodies what Christ was trying to um, tell us about God. That God is love. And if God is love, then we are supposed to continue to love. And this also falls in to what I believe uh, and what I've had as a vision for the church for the last almost 10 years. I'm um, going from the church in Illinois that we were at to even here where it kind of followed what we, we, you were talking about and we'll go back to that. But that if we are to love, we have to start with our love of God. And then we can move from that love of God to learning how to love each other even when that is very hard. And then when we learn to love each other, it's amazing how we can go and love and we can change the world. And it's a progression about transformation. And the story about John shows us all of those parts in there. That first you have to learn about God. And then once you learn about God and spend time with God and follow Christ's example, 
then by default we will start to learn to love each other. Even if we don't want to love each other, even if we are different and think differently and do not have the same theologies, it doesn't matter where we come from, who we are, or any of that, we are called to love each other. And then when we can learn to love each other, then by default we move into loving the world and passing it around as, as this vision statement says. So it's this progression and it all started with this desire to say, I am going to follow Christ. And I'm following Christ because Christ shows who God is. Shows what God is about. And John wanted that. John was one, again, being passionate and zealous and, and this sons of thunder. John wanted to be part of the best and associate with the best. And when he heard about Jesus, he just was led to them. And all of that. So that is what I want to talk about this morning. And it kind of, again, I'll, I'll say my vision because, you know, sometimes we don't, that doesn't line up. But I think that this vision is universal. That if we can love God and love others, then we can change the world or love the world, however you want to do that. And again, this statement moves us through it. It's a progression. It gives us something to start working towards. Instead of just saying, well, this is the vision. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do about it. I don't know how I'm supposed to love the world, especially when the world is the way it is today and there's people in this world that we just don't want to, to love. How am I supposed to do that? Well, this vision statement or, or this vision and this idea of what the Apostle John had to say shows us. Well, before I can love the world, I better learn to love God. And before I can love my neighbor, I better learn to love God. So then we can move to the next step and then the next step. And it's this continuing cycle to where if we foster that spiritual life, if we really understand and dive in to what God is about, we will learn how to take care of the other things. And we may not even do it consciously. We'll just all of a sudden start to change and be transformed. And people who we thought were unlovable at one time may seem a little bit better. I'm not saying we're going to fall head over heels for people all of a sudden, but we will learn to get along and to love in the way that God wants us to do that. So this idea, this life that John led, this vision, truly is one of those things that brings us into a spiritual spiritual growth and maturity in our lives, which is all our goal is. But let's start first, and we're going to use these banners over here too. But the first one says, love God. Now, everybody says, well, of course we love God. We love, love this mystery that it is. We love you know, the, the presence. We love all that things. We are to love God. That's not hard. I disagree. It is hard to start to follow God and to learn and to love God because it changes us and it challenges us to be people that we didn't think we could be or it puts us out of our comfort zones, but that's where it starts. And John, again, he was always looking for a fight, always ready to just let people know what he thought and all of this, but he knew there was something bigger. And if you read some of the biblical background and some other books, um, John was led to Christ through John the Baptist. John the Baptist was out there baptizing and telling people about what was coming. And, and James and John were intrigued and they said, okay, we have to go because Jesus is showing us who God is. So they got behind it. And they started to follow and learn and be taught from Christ and the ways of what Christ was doing. They learned to love God because Jesus was modeling that for them. They spent that time with Him, like I said, and they worshipped with Christ, and they learned from Christ. It is no different than why we come to church on a Sunday morning, or why we spend time in Sunday school, or we belong to small groups, or we read books and we read Bibles. It's so that we can spend time learning what Christ is telling us. Learning how Christ revealed God to everybody that Christ came into contact with. And as John started to follow Christ, John started to change. He went from being this brash, aggressive person to being called the apostle of love. 
I don't know about you, but that is a big transformation. Going from somebody who was like that, the sons of thunder, to somebody who was very loving and modeled that for a lot of people and became the beloved disciple. But again, it's because Christ showed the character and the passion of God in a way that was contagious to people. We as a church, we as individuals, need to learn how to love God and become who God is calling us in such a way that we become contagious to people. And we may not even, I say this all the time, we should be able to preach the Gospel or share the Gospel without even speaking a word sometimes. Without even having to say, you know what, I'm a Christian. Or you know what, I love God. My life should model that. Now, again, I share all of my shortcomings sometimes. Um, it's hard to do. I mean, we're human and we get upset and we get frustrated and sometimes we just don't want to do that. But when other people are looking and following and, and searching for something, we are to model in such a way that they say, you know what? So-and-so loves God and look at what they are doing. I need to learn to love God as well. And then again, when we start to love God and understand who God is, we move into the second part where it says we can love each other, love others. The greatest commandment, I shall love the Lord my God with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. And the second one, you shall love your neighbor just as much. You should love your neighbor. It's just as important as loving God. A lot of people, including myself, stop at the first part. We stop at the comma. And we say, well, the second part, Jesus didn't know what He was talking about. You know, Jesus never met so-and-so. I can't love these people. Jesus never had the deal. Jesus didn't live in 2015 when the world is falling apart. But... That's not what Christ said. Christ said, love God with everything you have and love your neighbor with everything you have. He didn't put any stipulations on that. At least what I have found. And I believe me, I've looked for those stipulations. You know, well, there's got to be a loophole in here somewhere, God, because surely this isn't what I'm supposed to be. But if my life is where it's supposed to be at and I'm following what Christ is telling me and I'm devoting my life to a God that says that God is bigger than anything, then by default I will learn to love each other. And I don't have to get frustrated or angry or any of those things in, in, in the way that I used to do. Because Christ brought that love and acceptance to those people. And, and that's the thing. People changed. I think one of the things that we can start to see is that when Christ touches people and people start to change, you cannot help but to notice that. You cannot help to notice people that start to live more in peace and start to live more and they have more contentment and all of these things. It happens without us even knowing that because we're placing our faith and our trust in a God that says, you are worth something. And then I have to remind myself that if God says, John, you are worth something, that means other people are worth that just as much. So we learn to love God and then we move into loving each other. Even if we are stretched and put out of our comfort zones, even if it is tough, we follow that model that Christ gave to us. And again, the tough part for me, I have to remind myself that when people look at me, they're either going to see the correct version of God or a distorted version. You know? And I'm not very proud of how many times the distorted version comes out. But we are called to continue this journey and to try. And we may never get to where it's perfect, but we continue and we walk and we say, all right, God, with You by my side, I can learn to love in ways I've never known before. And then, again, when we can love God and we start to love the person sitting next to us, our neighbors, the people around us that we deal with every day, then we can start to love the world and we can see the redemption that is ready in this world. We can see that God says there is nobody from anywhere in this world that is not worth my love. So go and help these people. Go and show these people my love. You know, I, I'm thinking, again, 
I know there's no place for politics up here, but I'm, I, these refugees that are so displaced, I think there's like 400,000 refugees that are fleeing countries that are so oppressed and they are just, they, they'd rather flee and live in these ref, refugee camps than stay where they were. We, as a world, should be figuring something out to help these people. To say, you know what, I don't really know your situation and you don't look like me and you may not even think like me, but God loves you. And because God loves you and because I'm worth God, you are worth God. So we are going to figure something out and let you know that you're not alone. And I know you get into politics and, and everything you read on Facebook says, well, we can't even help the veterans and we can't even help the homeless people here in our country, so why are we going to help other people? And to that I say that's nonsense. Somehow, again, this country or the world, there should be no need. Because if we were loving each other like we were called, and we were giving like we were supposed to, this world would be a much better place. This world would say, you know what? God is the author here. And I don't have the answers of how you do that. And believe me, I have no idea how we help 400,000 displaced people. But somehow... God says, I love you, you love me, you love your neighbor, now go love the world that is hurting. Can we move out of our comfort zones and our own heads and our own politics to say that this is bigger than any of the disagreements we have? That God's love transcends all of that. And John witnessed a changing world. John witnessed the change from when Jesus was here to after. And then John even witnessed, if you believe that John wrote Revelation, witnessed some vision that showed God being victorious in this world. And it all started with this idea that I'm going to love God and learn to love everybody else. But again, it's easy for us to turn on the news and have an opinion about it and complain and say, well, I can't believe this politician's doing that or I can't believe this is happening or look at this nonsense. And we, and we can say something has to be done. And I think what this vision does is it helps me to ask, okay, something needs to be done. What am I, what can I do about it? Is there something that I can do? And it may be little, but if we all thought that way, instead of just sitting and complaining, and instead saying, okay, yeah, I'm going to complain about it, but let's try to make it better. Imagine what the world can do. And imagine if the world can see God in everything that we do. Imagine what that world would look like. We are. This is the challenge. We are called to love God. And then we are called, and I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to hear it. We are called, challenged to love God, love others, and love the world. Constantly moving in this spiritual life. In our lives, again, all of us should be able to be like John. To say, this is where I started. And it may be tough. And it may be, and I am rough around the edges or whatever it be, whatever it may be. But it starts with me loving God and learning God. And that means that we are to follow Christ. Because Christ, and however you want to define God and all of the theology there, Christ modeled what it was supposed to be about. And if we are truthful, if we read the life of Christ, it is not what we have made it into. It is not what we have made Christianity into. For Christ, and I know I've said this before, Christianity, loving God, following God, was all about relationships with each other. It was not about what we make it. It was about loving each other and changing this world. Bringing the kingdom of God here now. You know, there's a theology that says the kingdom of God is here and not yet. Meaning that it is, we need to bring it and usher that in. And we do that by loving how God wants us to love. Learning who God is and that character of God. Because we can be transformed. And once we are transformed, other people can start to be transformed. And it, again, 
John did this. The disciple did this. Loved God, learned what that was all about, learned to love people that he never thought he would love, and he always wanted to, you know, if you read Luke chapter 9 and Mark chapter 9, and we highlighted that last week, you know, they were ready to call down fire from heaven to wipe out all of the Samaritans. You know, he goes from wanting to wipe out people and say that they have no, no place in the kingdom of God to learning to love everybody. That is an amazing, amazing transformation. Love God, love others, and love the world. And I want to close with this quote. And some of you may have seen it when I put it on Facebook. But I think that this is one of the most concise and best quotes I have found about what Christianity and what it means to love God and love each other is all about. And it says, Christians have often made being Christian very complicated. But ultimately, the central message of Christianity is simple. It is about loving God and loving what God loves. That means loving God as disclosed in the Bible and most decisively revealed in Jesus. Jesus is the incarnation, the embodiment of what can be seen of God's character and passion in a life lived among us. His passion was the kingdom of God. Christianity is a magnificent tradition. Like all religious and human traditions, it does have a shadow side. But at its best, it is about truth, goodness, and beauty. And it addresses the two great human yearnings, our longing for personal transformation and our desire that the world be a better place. The Christian message reduced to its essentials is love God as known in Jesus and then change the world. That, my friends, is what it is about. When, you know, in talking about getting frustrated, you know, when I read things on social media or I watch the news and watch these politicians make things into things that they shouldn't be about, I'm reminded of what Christianity is truly supposed to be about. And it's not, it's not what we see modeled to us. If we want to change the world, we better understand the truth. And we better understand that God is calling us to love each other. And that is it. Love God and love the things that God loves. Simple. Love God, change the world. Can we do that? We can, but it starts with us as individuals. And then we can join together in a collective and we can continue to change. But it all starts, just like the Apostle John, searching out Christ and saying, Christ, show me what I'm supposed to be about. Show me God so that I can show other people God as well. So I leave you with that question. You know, and we're going to sing if we were the body. Are you the body of Christ? When you say you are a Christian, do you understand that that means we are called to journey with each other and love each other? Do you understand that when I say that I'm a child of God, that means that I have a job to go out and change the world? The Great Commission. Jesus ended the Gospel of Matthew. Go out into all of the world preaching my message, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And remember, I will never leave you. Christ is with us. Gives us that example. How are we doing following that? How are you doing? Let us pray. Lord, that sounds simple. To love You, to love others, and then to love the world. But oh my, it is hard. It is hard some days to do that. But Lord, help us just to start at the beginning and not even worry about what comes next. Help us to start loving You. Help us to understand what You are calling us to be and to do and to be about. And if we can figure that out and spend time connected, we will learn to love others. We will learn to change the world because we were first changed. So we thank You for that model of Christ. 
We thank you for the model of these disciples that we can see ourselves in and know that we are called to do something big. So help us as we all wrestle in our own lives. Wrestle with the things that take us away from you and also the things that bring us closer to you. So just help us to be who you're calling us to be. Just as the children's story, keep writing our stories on our blank pieces of paper to be the kingdom of God. And all of God's people said, Amen. I encourage you, if you have time, to listen to this song as a devotion. And pay attention to those words and the questions that it asks. It says, if we are the body and we claim to be the body, why are we not acting like it? And don't misinterpret what I'm saying. There are people out there changing the world. Our denomination, our, this church, our, our fingerprints are places. But it's a small percentage of what can be. If all of us that claim that we are followers of God and Christians become the body, imagine what this world would be like. So think about that in your life this week. Listen to this song and ask, what am I doing to be the hands and the feet of Christ? And also just a reminder that next week we'll take a break from the disciples and we encourage you all to invite people as we celebrate here the history that this church has had the last 150 years and the way that this church in the last 150 years has done some great things and were the hands and the feet of Christ. And also just a reminder that there's a sign up there for the dinner next Sunday so that we can get account for that. But as we leave this place, my prayer is that as the light of Christ goes out, that we remember that we carry that with us and we can be the change that God is looking for. And one final time today, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.